Before you, 
sing that one more time, but I just just really want to give them glory in this place. I just encourage you guys to step out of yourselves and, and really lift high his name in spirit and in truth. He's worthy of all of our praises. This is something that we're going to be singing to him in eternity. Face to face to him, we're going to be singing, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. So let's just do it right now. Let's really lift his name high, every voice. Sing all the earth. stripped away and I simply come 
longing just to bring something that's of worth that will bless your heart. I'll bring you more than a song, for a song in itself is not what you have required. You search much deeper within, through the way things appear, you're looking into Coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry, Lord, for the thing I've made it, when it's all about you. It's all about. Jesus, we just thank you. Thank you for your presence. And Lord, we just glorify you. We praise you this morning. We thank you. We'll just let our words be few. Lord, be glorified. Just pray for every heart in this room, Lord, that you'd keep us in this place of worship as we get into your word now. And you would just feed us this morning with your word. In Jesus' name. Amen. You guys say hello to each other.
Good morning, good morning. It's an unruly bunch. Hey, hey, good morning, everyone. How's everyone doing? Merry day after Christmas. How is everybody's Christmas? Good? Praise the Lord. Mine too. That was awesome, actually. So we got a lot going on this morning, guys. We're going to be in Romans chapter 13, but we have a lot going on before we get there. So if you want to find that in your Bible, you can. If you don't have a Bible, raise your hand. Someone will bring you one. It's important that you have a Bible. If you need one, go ahead, raise your hand now. Speak now or forever hold your peace. You can always just get up and get one, too, because you know I'll call you out. That's what it is. So what I want to do first thing this morning is I want to invite Pastor Jim up. You guys know Pastor Jim is our U-Turn for Christ pastor here, and so we have a special morning. We have two guys graduating first phase this morning. Not only do we have two guys graduating first phase this morning, but we have one of those two guys that was supposed to graduate two weeks ago, but he decided to wait for his buddy before he graduated. How sweet is that? So I'm going to hand this over to Pastor Jim. Our God saves, amen. amen. I'm going to ask Bob and William to come on up here, and uh, we're going to present them with uh, the 60-day um, first phase graduation plaque. And a commemorative Bible from Chuck Smith's study Bible. And uh, so, so the, one of the verses that our, that our ministry is based on is 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ Jesus, he is a new creation. He has become new. Old things have passed away. And uh, these guys, you guys, we, we, I trust that you had a great day celebrating the birth of our Messiah yesterday. But today, we celebrate a new birth with these two gentlemen right here. You guys are witnessing a miracle. Jesus Christ, the miracle of restoration right here in front of your eyes. Amen. Amen. So I would like to, uh, I'm going to have Mr. Robert Rashko. And I think that's your Bible. Open that up and see if your name's in there. <laughs> I mixed them up. <clears throat> All right, got the right one. And William, if you guys want to scoot over a little more, you can get in the, get in the camera real quick. And uh, we are going to uh, just uh, thank the Lord for what he's done in your lives. And I know you guys are thankful. You have thankful hearts. And, and uh, like I said, you guys are witnessing um, what Jesus Christ can do in someone's life. And if there's anybody out here that doesn't know Christ as their personal Savior, this is what he does. He he returns and he and he and he restores lives. Their 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 moms are in, in are here. <laughs> I'm gonna start breaking down, but their families are restored back to them. Where 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 only God could do that. Nothing man couldn't do that. No program could do that. Only Jesus Christ could do that. So, so we're gonna we're gonna pray him out and uh, and keep on going, right, bros? Yes, sir. Amen. Dear Father, again we thank you for this time and we thank you for. Uh, each of their hearts, God, I pray for, for Bob and, and uh, his family and his uh, walk with you, God. Just continue to strengthen him in your word, in your spirit, in uh, all that you have for him. God, I, I thank you for the relationship that you've brought me and him together and Johnny and the whole, the whole group here at U-Turn Florida and this church. And God, I lift up William. I ask that you continue to pour your spirit out upon him, Lord, just to walk with him as, as, he, as he goes through this life, Lord, of restoration and and just uh, praising you, God, and you are great. You are a God that saves, Lord, and I thank you for these men's lives that uh, you've restored. And uh, God, just uh, continue to pour your spirit out upon this church and upon the ministries here. In your name, Jesus, we ask this. Amen. 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 Amen.
awesome experience, right? Bob and Will both, just so you guys know, have both committed to second phase. And so they're starting second phase right now. So first phase is 60 days, right? The second phase is six months. And so they both committed uh, to be in second phase and see what the Lord's going to do. It's amazing. It's amazing. Look at George. Listen, we would have allowed them to say something, but George took so long when he, when he graduated. So we're like, ah, we're not doing that anymore. Forget it. So now we're not, they're not even allowed to talk anymore. They just stand there. No, nah, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Hey, so now I want to invite uh, Pastor Rick and his wife Linda up. They're visiting from... These are very special people to me, so be nice, okay? They're visiting from Isotini, Africa, formerly known as Swaziland, right? I got that right. And I just want them to share with you guys about what's going on over there. You have to hold this. You can clip it to you. I greet you all in the name of our Lord. Yeah, he can translate. We greet you all in the uh, wonderful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Well done. Um, <clears throat> like Pastor said, uh, Rick and I are living in Eswatini, formerly Swaziland. Eswatini is the only country now uh, being run by a king. And I guess the king can make the decision to change the name. So about five years ago, he changed the name back to Eswatini. So that is where we are living. To give you a little bit of context, um, about 21 years ago, my youngest son was jumping on a trampoline, and there was three young boys around him jumping with him. They were older. And that son of mine, Weston, broke his leg. Weston, we are back now because Weston just graduated from university. One of those young men with Weston was Corey. So that gives you a little bit of context. In fact, I took a picture when Corey was up here because I want to send it to his mama, Carrie. So Carrie and I are also very, very good friends. So I can say, hey, saw your boy. Then another interesting thing, I will tell you, I remember the day that Shayla and Stephen, I'm going to cry. I can remember the day that they walked through the doors of Calvary Chapel, Palm Harbor. Stephen walked in those doors because Chela wanted to come to church. Little did this mighty man of valor know what the Lord had in store for him. Amen. <laughs> wow. Um, I was born and raised in Swaziland, now Eswatini, my parents were missionaries, and when we returned in 2006 just to have a visit, we saw the devastation that HIV and drought had made on this nation, and it created a massive amount of orphans, and at that time, the Lord just began to press upon my heart. Um, we started with just a, in fact, another crazy story I'm just remembering. I went to Carrie Saul. We were at a beach house, and I said to Carrie, Carrie, I feel like the Lord is saying I need to go back to Eswatini and do a women's conference, which was completely crazy. Because something like that was not done, and here I am living in the United States, and I went to Carrie, and Carrie looked at me, and she says, you're crazy. I don't even have a passport. Now, they're living over in Kenya. <laughs> but um, about five years ago, Rick and I made the move back to Eswatini, and we run an organization called Hope Alive 268, um, we have these little booklets back on the back table. Please feel free to grab some. Um, basically, with a nation of so many orphans, we literally have kids who are 9, 10 years old who are head of household, which means there's no parents around, there's no adults around. They are literally caring for their younger siblings. 
And so a lot of our ministry, most of our ministry, is towards the or orphan, vulnerable, and abused kids. So the first ministry that we started with is called the Care Division. That division goes out into very rural areas and sometimes even in city areas. And we feed children who otherwise would not be able to eat. So we work with the communities and we say, hey, we'll come in with the food, but you need to provide someone who can help to cook, who can help to kind of care for the kids when they come in to eat. That way you get the community involved and there is a lot more of a long-term vision when you do that. So that is part of our care division. The next division we have is our scholarship division, which we are helping kids who otherwise would not be able to go to school, to attend school. In Eswatini, um, it costs money to go to school. It is not free education, and it is relatively expensive considering um, all that is encompassed with going to school, your uniforms, your school shoes, your book bags, your books, everything. So you have kids that otherwise would be sitting at home. Statistics will tell you that it's three times more likely for a child to be abused, to be taken into human trafficking um, for early marriage if they are not in school. So that is what we do. But we don't just send them to school. We make sure what is happening at school, what is happening in the homestead that they live in. Is there electricity? 95% of our kids, there is no electricity. There is no running water. So we make sure. Do they have solar lamps? and our kids are doing so well. We don't do the education part. We do have a, a tutoring service that uh, they can come into the office because these kids have, are, are already behind. And so to be able to offer them the stability of saying, hey, where you're lacking, let's help you out with the tutor. That way we can also monitor. The minute a student walks in, you can tell by the look on their face that maybe there's no food at home or something is going on, someone has left that was maybe helping them take care. So that is part of our um, program that we do with the students. We also help them and do things that otherwise they would never have access to. Uh, riding in an airplane, seeing horses, touching horses, you know, those kinds of things that allows them to have a bigger picture of, of, of what is around them. The other division that we have is our new, uh, we call it CERT. That is our Community Crisis and Emergency Response Team. When the COVID epidemic hit, we had to put that in place because what COVID has done is put people in poverty, even more in poverty. So we see a lot of people and it's amazing because a lot of times we don't know what area we're going to be heading out to that day. We just say, Lord, just lead us to where we need to go. We literally, 95% of what I do is on back dirt roads and we're just driving along and someone on my team will say, let's go down this road. We go down that, yeah, let's go to that house. We go to that house and of course, anytime you uh, arrive at a house, you, you yell, Eka! which means home, and you wait for someone on the other end to answer back to you to say, hey, please come on in. We let them know this is why we're here, this is what we're doing, and we always leave them a food parcel. And I will tell you there are more times than none that they will say, I don't know who you are or where you came from, but just this morning I was praying and asking the Lord, we need food. I'm an old grandmother, and I had no food to feed my children tonight. And so we are just saying, Lord, lead us to where we need to go. So that is part of our CERT division. Then our last division that we have, we are in the fight against human trafficking. Human trafficking is a big, big problem in Eswatini, especially with South Africa and Mozambique. And so we are teaching about human trafficking. Obviously, with so many people trafficked, Every single year, 1% will ever be rescued. So we are, we are on the education part to let people know, especially these young, um, these young women, this is what it looks like. This is what you need to be aware of. So that is part of, uh, of what we are doing. So that is literally in a nutshell. But if you want to grab one of these books in the back, um, it will let you know how you can contact us, how you can follow us on Facebook, Instagram. We try to keep those a little bit up to date. But it is very, very difficult to really communicate to you exactly what we do. Um, anyways, but thank you very, very much. And like I said, it is such an honor and a pleasure to be here this morning and just to be able to see firsthand uh, what the Lord is, is doing in and through this church. So thank you, thank you very, very much.
Siabonga Gakulu means uh, thank you very much. Um, it's humbling to be here and to hear the words of uh, Pastor Jim as he encourages Bob and Will. That same encouragement, the counsel of the Lord, it's what goes before us every day. As we wake up in a strange land, yes, she was born there, but still that's not where we see our children, our grandchildren, our home church. But we know that God has a plan for us. And in that plan, he has made us into something that is so much more. You are a new creation today. And there's a purpose. And to continue in that purpose, it takes courage. And it takes the strength of the Lord that never fails. We must continue in that. And that is really the challenge that we have in our ministry is that Swaziland, Eswatini. It is, uh, if you look in the world book, it will tell you that it's 93% evangelized. The name of Jesus is known. The tragedy is that we have heart in our hearts. People are not growing in the knowledge of the Lord. They're not walking in his ways. We are not walking in his ways. We're new creations with a purpose. And it is our challenge to continue faithfully in that purpose. So what I will ask of you is that you will continue in prayer for Pastor Jim and the work that is being done here, for your neighbors, for the work that, and their ministry, and the, uh, and the ministry of every step as Christians, for missionaries, for the souls in Kenya, Arroyos in Esotini, whoever you support, continue in faith, praying, because it is not us. It is Christ through us. And it takes devotion. It takes prayer. It takes obedience. It takes faith. But above anything else, we have received a grace that promises so much more than our limitations. So thank you very much for your support to your local ministries and ministries around the world. Thank you. on there we go um, Rick and Linda have no idea uh, they might have some idea but they don't really have a full idea of how influential they've been in my life and what an amazing uh, witness they've been to me and so Linda mentioned that she remembers uh, when I walked into Calvary Chapel Palm Harbor when Chayla and I came in but I also remember the first time I got to sit with Rick and Linda and we got involved pretty much right away in a home fellowship that they were a part of and just watching the faith of those two and the willingness to step out and the willingness to go, it blows me away and it's encouraging to me and it, it's, been a, it, it's been a testimony in my life just to trust the Lord as I've watched them do that. And I, I know that I've shared with you guys before that um, you know I had to come to terms with the fact that not everybody is a child of God. I, I, I told you that we... I was in this Bible study, and I spoke out of turn when someone was teaching the Bible study about how, you know, we've been given a privilege to be called children of God. And I said, well, everyone is a child of God because I didn't know anything, and Rick set me straight on that. So it was Rick that you have to thank for me knowing uh, just that one thing and also many, many, many others. So thank you, Rick, and thank you, Linda, for what you guys are doing. It's an amazing testimony. I love you guys. And I want you guys to uh, do me a favor, do yourself a favor, talk to them after service, uh, see what you can be a part of with that ministry because it's amazing. All right, turn with me to Romans chapter 13. We're probably not, we're probably not going to get through the whole chapter this morning. We might, but we'll see. Um, but I want to just give you a little bit of context and remember what's going on. Remember that we've been working our way through the book of Romans, uh, that we've read through the first uh, 11 chapters of Romans 
It's predominantly doctrinal. It's the great doctrinal statement of the New Testament. Paul uh, builds perfectly and, and it builds a perfect case for the gospel and why you're in need of salvation and what now uh, that means in your life. That once you've received Jesus, what that means, what that entails. This uh, righteous standing before God by faith. You've been, gift, you've been gifted the righteousness of Christ. Uh, that you now have imputed righteousness, justification before him, that you've been, uh, that, you're, that all your, of your sin has been forgiven. But not only has it been forgiven, but there's no, now no record in heaven of that sin. That you have been justified before a holy God, just as if it had never happened. And not only that, now you're called a child of God, and you have peace with God, and you're called a joint heir together with Jesus. Amazing, amazing realities in scripture, right? And then we get into Romans chapter 12, and in Romans chapter 12, Paul begins the practical application part of the book of Romans, that now, in light of all these things that you've received, in light of what the Lord has done for you and who you are now in him, this is how you should walk in light of those things, right? This is how you should live. In Romans chapter 12, we've gone through just the very basic Christian life, that this is what you look like as a Christian. This is how you act, and, and we looked at the actions of a Christian, and the reactions of a Christian, the responses of a Christian, and how we should act. Now, if we just jump into Romans 13 without revisiting the end of Romans 12, it kind of seems like it's a, it's a total shift of gears, but it's really not. Remember what Paul ended Romans chapter 12 with, that we shouldn't take vengeance on anyone, right? That the, that the vengeance is the Lord's, that we can't execute our own judgment on those who we feel like have done us wrong, that we have to just walk in love and trust the Lord, that he's good, that he's going to avenge, that no bad deed, no sinful deed will go unpunished, right? That what's done in the dark will be brought to the light. And so if you just leave that laying the way it is, it, it, it leads to all these false understandings of Christ, that Christians can have, right? Well, if that's all true, then maybe we shouldn't have police, uh, that no one should that no one should have any judgment on anyone, that we should just trust the Lord, that someone breaks into your house at night and you catch them stealing all your stuff and you should just pray them off on their way and say, okay, I hope you have a blessed day with all my stuff and enjoy yourself because I know one day the Lord is going to execute judgment and it's all good. That's not at all what, what Paul would say. That's not what the Holy Spirit would tell us. And so uh, Romans chapter 13, building on the same idea, right? That we, as individuals, can't execute vengeance. We can't execute judgment on people around us. We can't execute justice because we are to just be reflections of Christ. But God has ordained institutions to deal with that, right? Three main institutions that have been ordained by God. One is the church. The other is the family. And the third is government. Government ordained by God, instituted by God, and put in place and has legitimate authority. So remember when Jesus, when they come to Jesus and they say, uh, should we pay taxes? Do we really have to pay taxes? And Jesus says, render unto what? Caesar what is Caesar's and unto the Lord what is the Lord's. And so right there in that very moment, Jesus, he uh, builds on the godly ordinance of government. He says that, God, that government is ordained by God. They have legitimate authority in your life. So render unto the government what is the government's. They, 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 have, they have a sphere of influence. They have a sphere of operation where God has ordained them to operate in. And so that's what we're going to get into in Romans 13. Now I will just tell you real quick, Romans 13 has been one of those like hot topics for the last two years. You guys can probably attest to that. You guys have probably heard many pastors teach on Romans 13 uh, over the last couple years. And I will also tell you that I have been very frustrated by a lot of sermons on Romans chapter 13. Okay, I think there's been a lot of misinformation that has been spoken, a lot of preaching out of context, a, a, a lot of just misunderstanding of Romans chapter 13. Here's what I'll say before we get into it. Romans chapter 13 does not develop the absolute authority of government. In fact, nowhere in Scripture are any one of those institutions ever granted absolute authority in your life, ever. The only absolute authority in your life is God himself, okay? The church has no absolute authority in your life because the church is fallible because it's made up of people, right? Uh, the family has no absolute authority in your life because, again, fallible, people do things wrong. 
And government has no absolute authority in the world. It's given uh, legitimate authority, but it's limited. Limited authority, right? And so, with that in mind, let's jump in. Romans 13, verse 1. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities. For there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore... Whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God, and those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore, you must be subject not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. For because of this, you also pay taxes, for they are God's ministers. Attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their due, taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom fear, Honor to whom honor. All right, we got it? Everybody's, we're on the same page? We'll just move on. No, we got to, we have to discuss this, right? So let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. This is important for us to understand, okay? Because we live in a culture, let's just take the United States, for example, and you see the divide that is happening within our country, right? Greater now than ever before that you have a partisan divide in our country and people on both sides of that are so passionate about their side and they hate each other on the other side, right? You see it happening more and more and more and more often. And even within the church, we fall victim to this because we have our own ideology. We have our, we, we have our own standard. We try to follow the truth of God's word. And when there are uh, governing authorities in place that don't adhere to the word of God, what we tend to do is ridicule them, call them names, hate them, not support them, whatever, right? And you see it all the time. And you even see factions and and dividing within the church because of these things. But look at what Paul is saying here. Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority. Listen, there is no authority except from God. And the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Now, you might say, yeah, yeah, but Paul has no idea about what we're going through today. You're right. You're right. He has no idea. It was way worse for Paul. Way worse. Listen, Paul is writing this under the Roman occupancy of Caesar Nero, who will eventually kill Paul, right? And he'll burn Christians at the stake to light his garden at night. He'll declare war on Christianity. Basically, he makes it illegal to be a Christian. At this point, when Paul writes this, it's still semi-legal to be a Christian because according to Caesar Nero in Rome, Christianity was just another sect of Judaism, which was allowed in the Roman uh, world. And, and so eventually, as Paul comes before Nero, Nero changes his mind. You guys know about Caesar Nero, right? He goes totally insane. Uh, he kills his wives. He, uh, he actually killed his mother. All kinds of, this is a crazy dude. But you have to know a little bit more about history than just that Caesar Nero was crazy because for the first while uh, of his kingship, He wasn't that bad. He was actually pretty sane. He had things pretty decently together, and he was a decent ruler. And so as Paul writes this, he says, look, you have to be subject to the governing authorities because there is no authority except from God. So those who are in authority were placed there by God. Remember what Daniel tells us, that the Most High rules in the kingdoms of men, and he sets over it whomever he wishes, sometimes even the basest of men. Now, this is what you have to understand about about the rulers and authorities that are put in place by God is they are not always in place for blessing. Sometimes they're put in place for judgment. Sometimes the the Lord would use even the basest of men, put them in a position of authority to execute judgment on a people who are disobedient and dishonoring to God. That's just true. Look through history, you see it over and over and over and over again. In fact, even with the children of Israel, who does he use to execute judgment on the kingdom of Judea? 
Nebuchadnezzar. Nebuchadnezzar, who was a pagan leader, who was totally out of his mind. He was a world conqueror, and he takes them away captive into Babylon. Now, I believe that Nebuchadnezzar hears from the Lord. I believe he gets saved. Uh, but then right after that is Cyrus. Right after that is Alexander. And so you have world rulers put in place to execute judgment on the people of Israel who are not godly people. They're put in place for judgment. And so all, all rulers, all authorities are ultimately put in place by God. And so he says, be subject to them. Basically what he's calling us to do in Romans chapter 13 is to be good citizens. To be good citizens. First and foremost, listen guys, this is important for you to understand. First and foremost, we are citizens of heaven. That's, that's who we are. This is not our home. We're pilgrims, sojourners here. Uh, we're ambassadors from a foreign land in a foreign land, right? We don't belong here. We're just sent out as ambassadors for Christ as though God were pleading through us so that we could bring light to a lost and dark and dying world. That's what we're here to do. And so as we're here, we should be the best citizens. We should be kind. We should be giving. We should be gentle. We should be loving. We should be uh, speaking things, speaking life to people around us who need to hear. That's what we should be doing. Because listen, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God because government is ordained by God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. Now, this is where it gets important for us to understand. For rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. So Paul, as he writes Romans 13, is presupposing certain things, right? The Holy Spirit moving Paul to write this because he says that if you don't want to be afraid of the government, those who are in authority, then you should do good things. Because they're not a terror to good works, but to evil. So the government, first and foremost, their first uh, role that is ordained by God is to punish evil. That's what the government is there to do. Remember, at the end of Romans chapter 12, Paul says to not take vengeance on anyone, because vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. That we should love our enemy and trust the Lord to do what is right, trust the Lord to execute judgment and vengeance. And then he goes on to say, because government is ordained by God to do that very thing, to execute judgment on evil. So Paul is presupposing a government that judges evil, right? That's what he's saying here. He's saying that if you don't want to be afraid of the authority, do what is good and you will have praise from the same because he who is in authority is God's minister, servant to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Now, I've heard over and over and over again, specifically in 2020, of churches who close down. Now, listen, that's up to the pastor. The pastor is in control of his flock. He's, I'm trusting that they're hearing from the Lord and they're doing what is right. But over and over and over again, I hear them teaching on Romans 13 and saying, well, we have to be subject to the governing authority and we just have to do what they say. That is, that is true insofar as it doesn't disagree with the commandment given to us by God. So as the Lord has commanded us to do certain things, commanded us to be a certain way, uh, to live a certain way, and as long as the government is punishing evil and not doing anything that disagrees with God's commandments, then we do exactly what government tells us to do, right? Because they don't bear the sword in vain. They're there for our good. They're there to punish evil. And, and if we don't want to be afraid of the authorities, then we do what is good in the sight of them and God. The problem, though, occurs when those who are in authority are passing ordinances that are ungodly. The, for example, it is legal in our country to get an abortion, right? That's legal. But do we support that as Christians? We can't, right? We just can't. Because of the sanctity of human life, because every person is made in the image of God, we cannot support that. In fact, in our country, it's legal uh, for same-sex marriage. Can we support that as Christians? Absolutely not. Do we love those people? Of course we do. We preach the gospel to them, but we can't support that because God has ordained marriage. That's his. He defines the parameters, and nobody else can change that. 
And so do we agree with government when it comes to that? No, we can't. Now let me see if I could find something that is like applicable to today. Maybe, um, I know this seems crazy, but like not being allowed to sing in church or not being allowed to gather together as the saints of God, listen, that directly opposes what Jesus has told us to do, right? And so when the government would exercise uh, outside of their realm of authority, exercise uh, outside of their jurisdiction, what we do as Christians is politely decline to follow that ordinance. That's, that's what we have to do. In fact, I want you to think about this for a second. In the first 300 years of Christendom, it was illegal to be a Christian. It was illegal. Paul will be martyred for his faith and for his preaching. And so, what did they do in light of that? Hey, listen, we have to just submit and do what's right. We have to do what the government tells us to do at all costs because they have absolute authority in our life. No, absolutely not. Paul presupposes that the government is in place to execute justice, to execute judgment on those who do evil. That is their role ordained by God. The problem will be when the government operates outside of their jurisdiction. For example, in the first century, Caesar was Lord. That's, that's what you were supposed to say, right? Caesar is Lord. And the Christians wouldn't say that. Christians wouldn't say that because Jesus is Lord. Only Jesus is Lord. Now you would say, well, wouldn't it be smart for them to just say that even if they didn't really mean it? They could just say it and then not, and get around, you know, being executed for their faith, being burned at the stake, being fed to lions, or being their, having their heads cut off. They could just say Caesar is Lord but not really believe it. Listen, it's a testimony to the people around them. It's a testimony to the unbeliever, their faith, when they say, I will not bow the knee to Caesar. He is not my Lord. Only Jesus is Lord. It, it, it is our job and our role and our duty as Christians uh, to resist tyranny. Now, maybe that sparks some things in your mind. Yeah, that's right. We should start a militia. We should <laughs> come for my gun, see what happens. Listen, we're called as Christians to die to our liberties, right? To die to our personal liberty for the sake of others. What does it look like as a Christian to resist tyranny? What does it look like as a Christian to hold strong, to hold fast to that which we've been called to be, to that which we've been called to do? What does it look like? Does it look like fighting and killing? I, I, I'm telling you that you're going to have a really, really difficult time coming up with a defense of that in the New Testament. You're not going to find it. The Christians are called the diaspora, the scattered seed, those who had to flee because of the oppression that was coming against them. And as a result, the message of the gospel went to the whole world. Our job is to resist tyranny and not, be over, not to overcome evil with evil, but to overcome evil with good to preach the gospel, to love the people around us, no matter what it might cost us, no matter if it might even cost us our life, our job is to show the world how much Jesus loves them. And how do we do that? To be so filled with the love of Jesus that no matter what, no matter how hard the world would come against us, no matter what oppression would come upon us, the pressure of the world that is pushing down on us, we would just pour out the love of Christ. We would love those who persecute us. We would bless those who persecute us, not curse them. Bless and not curse. To love our enemy. To preach the gospel to them, even if it costs us our life. Now, when they tell me that, I, listen, I've heard pastor after pastor after pastor say this. And I don't doubt their conviction. Listen, if they tell me I can't preach the gospel, I'm preaching it. And if they put me in jail for it, I'll be in jail preaching it. I've heard that a lot. I don't doubt their conviction, just like Peter, when he says, Lord, I'm willing to die for you. I'm going to die right now. I'm willing to do it right now. I don't doubt Peter's conviction. He was willing to die. But he had no idea of the temptation of the enemy. He had no idea of the, subtle, the subtlety, the nuances of the enemy's cunning plans for his life. But here's what I really genuinely, genuinely believe. If they tell me I can't preach, if they tell me that we can't be open, we'll be open. We'll be preaching. 
I'll be preaching, even if it's to no one. I don't blame you for not being here. I'll be here preaching to the empty chairs if I have to, right? I mean that. We have to settle in our hearts what hill we're willing to die on. What, 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 what is really worth it to us to stand for? Because ultimately, we live in a time where evil is being celebrated and good is being punished. And from the top down, it's happening over and over and over again. I'm not, I, I'm not, I don't want to spark a rebellion. I don't want to spark uh, an insurrection. But the truth is Christianity in and, of, in and of itself is an insurrection. That's what it is. It is a rebellion. It is a rebellion to the system of the world, uh, to the system that the enemy has put in place. And, and our job is to stand against it, to be a light in the midst of darkness, to be steadfast steadfast and immovable in our faith. And when the tide of culture pulls so hard against us, we need to be the ones standing strong, holding on to the rock of Jesus Christ, not willing to bend on our convictions. Now, I will say, if your conviction, uh, conviction is not biblical, then let it go. If you're willing to die on a hill that is not biblical, let it go. But when it comes to issues of morality, uh, when it comes to the truth, of God's word, we should be lions. We should be unwilling to yield, unwilling to give anything back when it comes to the truth of scripture. When it comes to your opinion, who cares? Let it go. We all have them, right? We all have our political opinions. We all have uh, the side of the aisle that we sit on, whatever that means. Let it go. Let it go. It doesn't matter. It has no eternal weight. It doesn't echo in the, hall, in the halls of eternity. It means nothing. When it comes to biblical truth, we cannot, we will not yield. For he is a minister to do good for you. But if you do evil, be afraid. Listen to this. For he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. So I would say that right here in verse 4, you have Paul developing and supporting capital punishment. Right? Right? The death penalty for those who would do evil because here the sword is a direct reference to execution. And he says those who are put in place, the authorities that are put in place in God have legitimate authority to execute judgment, to execute wrath on those who would do evil. Now, I know there are all kinds of problems with our judicial system. I know that for a fact because I visit the guys in prison on Thursdays and I see the problems in our judicial, judicial system. But biblically... We, there is a right for those who are ordained by God in authority, placed there by God to execute capital punishment. It's just there. If you want to uh, debate about it, see Corey after service, and he'll, <laughs> he'll talk with you about it. Listen to this. Therefore, you must be subject, not only because of wrath, but also for conscience sake. The point is... If you want to suffer, make sure you're suffering for righteousness sake. Don't oppose the government just for your own opinions and for the things that you want to hold on to that are not biblical because your conscience sake suffers as a result. You're going to be convicted over that. What we should do is be the best citizens that we can be, the best citizens that the world has ever seen while walking in the truth of God's word. Amen? Are we all on the same page? All right. Now, if, you, if I haven't alienated enough of you, uh, let's get into verse 6. For because of this, you also pay taxes. For they are God's ministers, attending continually to this very thing. Render, therefore, to all their due. Taxes to whom taxes are due. Customs to whom customs. Fear to whom fear. And honor to whom honor. Now, listen. What people will do is say, okay, I get that, but this is an ungodly government that is in place right now, that they're punishing good, and they're excited about evil. Therefore, I don't have to pay taxes because Paul is presupposing a good government here, so when it's a bad government, I shouldn't pay taxes. Wrong. That's wrong. What we do is follow Scripture, and Scripture says to render to whom taxes are due, render them. So if you're fudging on your taxes, quit. Stop. You're being a bad Christian. Be honest. Uh, render taxes to whom taxes are due. Honor to whom honor, are due, uh, honor is due. Customs and uh, fear. 
Now, I do want to say something uh, regarding Romans chapter 13. We only have five minutes left, so we'll just stop here because I do have something important, I think, to say about this. When thinking about uh, the authority of government that is put in place, now we have uh, something special here in the United States that not every single country in the world has. We have a, a constitution, and our constitution uh, was founded with godly influence, okay? Uh, with Judeo-Christian values in mind when the Constitution was formed. And in fact, if you've never read the Constitution, you should read it. You should. I, 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 you guys know that I'm not political from the pulpit because I don't think that's my job. I was given two tasks by God, teach the Word, love the people. But when the Word deals with this, we should talk about it, okay? And so we have a tool given to us in this country called the Constitution. So it's very important that you understand. It's very important that you read it, that you know it. The Constitution is the highest form of government in the land. In the land of the United States, the Constitution is the highest authority when it comes to government in our land. So when you have lesser magistrates of the government that are passing ordinances that are unconstitutional, I would say that if you follow those unconstitutional uh, creeds and ordinances given to you by the government that is set in place, that is given their authority by the Constitution, and when they step outside of their authority and they pass unconstitutional ordinances, you should, in agreement with Romans 13, not adhere to those unconstitutional things. Because Romans 13 says you have to obey the governing authority that is put in place by God, and we have the Constitution as the highest governmental authority in the land, and that uh, basically dictates every other authority in our nation. And so if you don't know it, read it, know it, and when laws are passed that are unconstitutional, our job is to politely decline to follow them. Amen? Regardless of how you feel about uh, pastors shutting down churches, whatever, regardless of how you feel about any of that, when it's a tyrannical command, we have an obligation as Christians to politely decline to follow them. And so, verse 8 says, Owe no one anything except to love one another. This is the point of all of it. This is the point, guys. Listen, Romans 12, Romans 13, difficult sections of Scripture, difficult for us to, not really to understand, but to abide by, difficult for us to not take vengeance on one another, Dif difficult for us to not avenge ourselves or to bless those who are cursing us, to love our enemies. These are difficult things for us just as people, as Christians. It's difficult. Uh, rendering to Caesar what is Caesar's, difficult. But yet the whole point of that is summed up here in verses 8, 9, and 10. This is the point. Owe no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. This is the purpose, guys. This is why the laws were given. Th this is what it lays out in all of the commandments of the law is love. Uh, Jesus said on these two things, you can hang all the law on the prophets. Uh, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your, all your soul, all your mind and strength, and love your neighbor as yourself. Th on these two things, hang all the law on the commandments. This is the purpose. As you are oppressed by the world, as, as uh, ungodly ordinances are passed, where the government is pushing down on you, or whatever it is, where the weight of the world is pressing on you, the only thing that it should squeeze out of you is love. That's it. Uh, what, what the world should be able to accuse us as Christians of is they love everybody. It's so frustrating and annoying. They just love everybody so much. Every time I'm trying to make them mad, every time I'm coming against them, all they do is pray for me and bless me and love me. I can't stand it. Listen, as you, as you do that, you're going to heap coals of fire on their head, right? As you look different than the world around you, as you're following Jesus steadfastly, giving your whole heart to him, so filled with his love, there's, they're gonna, there's gonna be a time where they look at you and the persecution that's pressing in on you, the weight that's on you, and you're living that way, they're going to say, 
man, what is the reason for this hope that's within me? And you can be ready in that moment to give them the gospel. You can be ready in that moment to say, look, it doesn't matter what I go through on this side of heaven. It doesn't matter what they take from me because I have eternity together with Jesus in heaven. I've been given new life in his name. All of these things mean nothing. Our job is to oppose the tide of culture. Our job is to stand out, but not to just be defiant. It's so that we can shine the light of Jesus Christ. It's so that we can love the world. Why? What's, what's the point? And listen, I, I see Christians all the time that are so ready and willing to get fired up and to fight for something that is ungodly. To fight for something that is totally unbiblical. That has no eternal weight. But so much less willing to just love their neighbor. So much less willing to just share the gospel with someone they don't know. Listen, he says here, to love your neighbor, and in so doing, you are fulfilling the law. Guess who your neighbor is? A real person. Your neighbor is actually a real person. It's really easy to say, oh, I love everybody. Everybody, this nameless, faceless mass of people. Sure, I love everybody. It's a lot harder to love an actual, fallible person. To love the person who lives next to you. To love the person who's sitting next to you in these seats right now. To love the person who you run into at the grocery store, especially when they disagree with you. Man, that's difficult. That's what you're called to do, to love. And so maybe the first part of this you're pumped about, right? Yes, opposing culture, opposing ungodly commandments given to us. But I can't wait to do that. How do you do that? By loving, that's not what I had in mind. That's what you're called to do. That's who you're called to be. I think it was Corey Ten Boom who said that you need to be so filled with the sweet water of Jesus that no matter how violently shaken, you can never spill a bitter drop. That's true. Be so filled with the love of Christ that that's all the world sees in you. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father, we're so thankful for your word, thankful for your truth, Lord. Help us to be lights that shine in this world. Help us to be uh, steadfast and immovable. Lord, established with our feet on the rock of Jesus Christ. Lord, put a new song in our mouths that may be praised to our King continually, Lord. Even when the world seems dark, even when it's growing darker around us, Lord, let us pray. Let us love. Lord, would you remind us to be praying for the persecuted church around the world right now. Lord, remind us to be praying for your saints that you have in those places that they would be lights standing out amongst the crowd, that the world would flock to them, that there would be rivers of living water flowing from their hearts and from ours. Lord, let people come, gather to hear you, to come into your kingdom. Lord, would you wake hearts to life. Pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Let's worship the Lord.
says, for the life that I now live in the flesh is, uh, is not mine, it's not my own, there's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, right? This, this life that we live here on earth is not our life. The life of the Christian is Jesus, the life of Jesus being lived through the believer, right? That's what being a true Christian is. So that's our job, to reflect him in all that we do, say, everything, wherever we are doesn't matter. doesn't matter how dark the situation is. Our job is to shine the light of Christ. That's who we are. Amen? Listen, before you leave, please see uh, Linda and Rick, just so you can know more about what's going on over there. Just pray for them. Listen, we need to be reminded to be praying for the missionaries all over the world that are doing what they're doing. It's a high calling. It's a difficult calling. And yet the Lord is using them so mightily. So be praying for them. Get to know them. I love them. You won't be sad that you got to know them better. Uh, that way you know who you're praying for. Amen. Let me pray for you. Lord, uh, would you bless your church this week? Father, as they uh, go about their lives, Lord, would you anoint them, empower them to live for you more fully, God, to be surrendered fully to your truth, to your word, to your grace and mercy, God, that they would be so transformed. They would look so much like you that the world wouldn't know them that the world would want what they have. Give them opportunities this week. Lord, give them boldness in those opportunities to shine their light. We just praise you, Lord. We thank you. It's all for your glory. It's for you, Jesus. Amen. Amen. You guys be blessed. Till next week. I love you.